This video shows how to get started with the Tang Nano 4K FPGA development board. In particular, it shows how to use the ARM Cortex M3 core that is on the board's FPGA. This M3 core is a hard IP block, meaning it's implemented with dedicated hardware and does not consume significant FPGA resources other than block SRAMs. This is in contrast with the Pico RV32 core that I have used in previous videos. The Pico RV32 core is a soft core. It is built from FPGA resources and would consume more than half of the resources of the FPGA on the Tang Nano 4K. The M3 is also a much more sophisticated core than the Pico RV32. It runs at up to 80 MHz on the Tang Nano 4K. Here's the M3 subsystem on the FPGA. All the blocks on the left are hard IP blocks, although some can be enabled or disabled. The white blocks on the right, inside the box labeled FPGA Fabric, are built using FPGA resources. The only one you must use is some SRAM. It can be set as large as 16 kilobytes, but this size consumes 80% of the available block SRAMs on the FPGA. Today, we'll focus on the M3 core itself and use the GPIO block to blink an LED and sense a switch's value. We'll also use one of the UARTs. Notice that this means we will not integrate the M3 with any significant use of the FPGA's other resources. This is a poor use of the FPGA. If all you want is a core with peripherals like those shown on this diagram, you are far better off simply using a microcontroller. To integrate the M3 with something you design with the FPGA's resources, you need to use the AHB2 or APB2 blocks. These are relatively complicated and may be the subject of a future video. Learning about and experimenting with these industry-standard ARM interfaces is a good reason to buy a Tang Nano 4K. Here's a picture of the Tang Nano 4K board. There is not much on this board aside from the HDMI and a camera interface. There are two buttons, only one controllable LED, and a spy flash on the board. The wires are for a USB to CMOS serial adapter. More on this later, but it's very disappointing that an external adapter is needed. The 4K board already has a USB chip that contains a serial adapter. This chip is used for JTAG, but the Tang Nano 4K's designers apparently could not spare two pins to connect the FPGA to the chip's serial adapter function. It means you must use an external adapter in order to use a UART on the M3 to interact with the terminal window. Here's the pinout of the Tang Nano 4K, as well as some other information. The FPGA on the board is a Goen GW1NSR-LV4C. Frankly, there is some more disappointment. The pins marked with an X either should not be used for general purposes or must be used with care due to things like pull-ups. You can see there are very few unencumbered 3.3 volt pins. Even the onboard 27 MHz oscillator is not connected to a good clock input pin of the FPGA. It works, but designs may suffer from additional clock skew. In most respects, I think the Tang Nano 4K board is a poor choice compared to the Tang Nano 9K or the 20K. Its one and only big advantage is the integrated Cortex-M3. If you need a good core on a cheap little FPGA or want to learn about those standard ARM interfaces, the Tang Nano 4K is for you. So let's make that M3 work. Since we are not using the AHB2 or APB2 interfaces today, the Verilog will be super simple. Here's the Goen IDE running on Windows. We can see what version we have here. I'm still using the educational version because I don't want to mess with the license, but I have been told that the Pro version has some advantages. And it's also free, but you have to email off to get a license. Maybe someday I'll do that. Um, for the Tang Nano 4K, the device that you want to use when you create a project is, is this one, shown here. So use that when you create a project. So the uh, the Verilog file is here, the Verilog top level. There's not much to it. So first, the signals that we're using. We have an input wire that's the clock. This is the 27 megahertz oscillator on the board. And then I'm using button two as a reset button. That button, when you press it, goes low. So it works as an active low reset. And then here are two signals for the UART. So they're connected to the um, serial adapter that I talked about previously. And then I've got in-out wires for the two GPIOs. One goes to an LED and the other one goes to the other button. And these are in-outs because software can determine whether it's a GPIO input or an output. They default to being uh, inputs. And so if you've got one that's to be an output, you need to make a call to, to an API that in the software that I'll show later. 
and that will set it as an output. And down here, this instantiates the Cortex M3, and, and then it's connected to the various signals that we already talked about. So the clock goes to the clock, the two UART signals are connected to the UART signals, and, and so on. There are actually 16 GPIOs, and I'm only using two of them, button one and LED. So I declared this wire here, um, 14 wide, essentially to make some warnings about things being disconnected go away but we're not actually using the upper 14 of the GPIOs. And so what's interesting is how you instantiate the M3 inside the IDE. So you do that using the IP core generator tool. And, and then down here under soft IP core, there's multiprocessor or microprocessor system, hardcore MCU. And this is, this is under soft IP core because some of the things that you instantiate might be built from FPGA resources. So if I double click on this, it brings up this picture and you can manipulate this picture to instantiate what you want. So I wanted to use UART zero. So I double click there and say enable UART zero and it turns green. I also want to use the GPIO. So I say enable GPIO. And the second thing is automatically here. This gives the bidirectional interface that I'm using. So you'll normally want these both to be checked. And this will instantiate all 16 GPIOs. You can't instantiate fewer than that. And then for SRAM, you can pick how much you want. The default is 16 kilobytes, I think. And that's what I'm using. If you use less, it'll use fewer of the block SRAMs and you'll have them available for your project. But these are the choices and, and the configuration of the Cortex M3 system that I'm using. So now if I say OK and say to overwrite the one that I've already got, I can do that. And do I want to add the generated files to the project? Yes. And then, like always with the IP generation tool, it, it gives you this text to essentially paste into your Verilog. So I already did that. I've already got it. So I don't need to repeat that. So that takes us back to here. So this is the results of what I could have pasted, but then I would have had to type in the changes that I made to the parameters. And so this is all there is to the Verilog. It's extremely simple. Let's make it work. We'll build the FPGA project, which will take a, just a moment. It's very small. So now it's built. And now we have to run the programmer. So I click here. And then sometimes you need to double uh, right click and go to cable setting and USB cable setting to let it discover the Gowan device. So that's done. And then the next thing to do is to double click on operation and pick MCU mode and then er erase a uh, firmware erase program. And then down here, we have to pick the image for the software, which is in the C code directory and it's called prog.bin. So I say save. And now we can start the programming and let's bring TerraTerm to the front. And when the programming is complete, we should see the LED light on the board and also some text print in TerraTerm. So the programming takes just a moment. And now it's done. So the M3 is working. It printed hello world and the CPU ID register, uh, which is the correct value for a Cortex M3. And now to test UR input, it just says to, to type some character. So I'll type hello. And you notice as I do that, the LED flashes. So I can turn the LED on and off. So looks like the program's working. Um, except one more thing to show is that every time I press a character, it samples the state of, of button one, I guess. And so it's saying it's not pressed, but if I reach over here and press it, then it shows that the button is pressed. So the LED is showing that GPIO output works, and that button is showing that GPIO input works. You can also press button two as the reset button, and the whole thing just starts again. So that's the project working. For software, there are a couple of documents available on the Goan website. This first one, frankly, isn't all that useful, but it describes, if I scroll down a little bit here, that there are two programming environments that you can use to program the M3 on the Tang Nano 4K. So the bottom one here is this Goan MCU designer, and they, all of their examples use this. But I got that the installer for that from the website, and on my Windows 10, it failed to install. So I got nowhere with this. The other choice is the ARM Kyle MDK. And the Cortex M3 core is a sophisticated core. So I think if you're doing something serious with it, you really should try to get this to, to work. But I didn't try. 
I decided to do software on my own, um, starting with nothing but a, but a Cortex-M toolchain. And so for that, the second document available from Goen is critical. And this is, this is a very useful document. And what it does is it describes the hardware interfaces that software can see on the M3. So here's its table of contents. And one of the key things is the memory map. It's like, what are the addresses of the various things on the Cortex M3 or from, the, from its point of view? So if I click here, you'll see the address map. So the flash starts at address zero and is 32 kilobytes in size. And then the SRAM is selectable in size as we saw, but its starting address is hex two followed by seven zeros. And then the programming model for the various peripherals that are available to you it is that they also have registers in the address space. And so this gives the addresses of all of those. And so if I scroll down quite a bit, um, we'll see the programming model for the UART, for example. So here, here it is in section four. So it gives a little overall overview information about it, but this is the real key here. So you know, this tells you that, for example, you have to enable RX and TX in the control register before they work. And that's bit zero and one of this register at offset eight from the base address of the UART that we saw above. So this document is was very critical to me in writing my own software and would also be very useful if you're trying to understand exactly how the M3 works and maybe debug software that you developed with the Kyle MDK. And so other documents of use, there is the uh, ARM V7M architecture reference manual, the famous ARM ARM uh, for Cortex-M. And this document is tough going, but, but if you want to know how Cortex-M cores really work, this is what you have to study. And then for the Cortex-M3 specifically, there's the technical reference manual. And what it does is describes sort of how the Cortex-M3 implementation complies with the architecture in the in the architecture document. And so you, you can't just read the TRM, you actually need to have them both. And I found some, some critical information in, in here that I'll tell you about in a minute. My software is in the project's C code directory. This whole project will be on GitHub, see below for a link. And there's a readme in this file that you should take a look at. And it describes how to get a tool chain. And so in particular, if you're running on Linux, all you have to do, at least Ubuntu Linux, all you have to do is apt install GCC ARM none EABI, and that will give you the needed tool chain. Also make sure that you have make available. And I'm actually running the IDE on Windows. And so I'm running Ubuntu on the Windows subsystem for Linux on my, on my Windows machine. And that's working out basically okay and makes it very easy to get a tool chain. If you're just using Windows, I don't know how you get a tool chain. So sorry about that. So anyway, um, the software is here. And if you type make, it will build it. And that will create the file prog.bin that you have to program into the flash, as we saw before. And this is just a raw, plain, binary file. And so let's take a look at this. We'll do make clean. And I guess we'll start at the beginning and look at the startup.s. So uh, this file is in assembly language, and it starts out with some attribute stuff that I just got because the compiler spit it out. I really don't know what it does, but I copied it. And uh, the key in this file is, is this, uh, is the, are these words in the .txt section? So the way that uh, Cortex-M3 works is that there's an interrupt vector table right at the beginning of memory at zero. And it contains the addresses of interrupt handlers for various kinds of interrupts, um, but also the address for a reset. So when the processor starts running, uh, it automatically, first it sets the main stack pointer to the value that you give here. And the main stack pointer is the only one that my software is using. The M3 actually supports two different stack pointers, which you could read about in the ARM documentation. Um, but then the processor then, then immediately branches to address start. And this plus one is very tricky. It took me ages to find this. It's what was preventing the M3 from working for me for a long time. And what that does is it tells the system that we're running in thumb mode. And that's a limited instruction form of the instruction set that, that the M3 supports. 
And that thumb mode is the only thing that the Cortex M3 supports. And so if you leave off this plus one, it doesn't work. So it's basically setting thumb mode. And I think that might be true for all of the other inter interrupt vectors as well, but I'm not using any of them. And so address start in this file just calls a function called continue startup. So that's how things get started. And so now in continue startup, I get to be in C at this point, which is a little bit easier. And so all this does is copy initialized mutable data from flash to SRAM. And that's done by this loop here. It also clears BSS in the SRAM. And then finally it calls main. So not much going on here, but it's important if your program's using initialized data or relying on uninitialized variables being zero. So then main.c is here. And it's not doing too much. It's using the UART and GPIO drivers that I wrote. And basically, it starts out by setting up the GPIO. It has to call GPIO init. It sets the direction of GPIO0 to be an output. That's the one that's driving the LED. And it also sets its value to 0, so it starts being not lit up. And then we initialize the UART. So this is the baud rate divider. So you get that by taking your clock speed, 27 megahertz in my case, divided by 115200, because that's the serial port speed I'm using. And then it prints hello world, and also reads from this special address. That's a special ARM register that gives the CPU ID. And I wanted to prove that I could read those registers, so I, so I did that. And then basically it, it just uh, waits for you to type a character and then prints what you typed, as well as the value of the button press you know, whether it's uh, pressed or not. And so that's really all there is to the main software. We'll take a quick look at one of the drivers in uart.c. And so the first thing you have to do is call uart init, and you say which of the uarts you're initializing. It could be uart0 or uart1, and give that baud div. And then it sets the baud div register to baud div, and also enables rx and tx like you have to do, like I, I showed before. And then there are functions for printing characters and strings and, and getting characters and printing hexadecimal. So all in all, it's, it's pretty simple and very small, but it's good for getting started and proving that the Cortex-M3 is working. So the make file is also here, not much to it. And so you can take a look at this software on the GitHub. The USB serial converter you need looks like this. You should be able to find one on Amazon. Sometimes these are built with counterfeit chips and won't work on Windows, at least not without finding a special driver. But they all tend to work out of the box on Linux. I checked mine to ensure it's using 3.3 volt signaling. In summary, the Cortex M3 is the Tang Nano 4K's most interesting feature. Good next steps include getting ARM Kyle running and developing something on the FPGA to connect to the ARM standard interfaces APB2 and AHB2. I'll end the video here. See below for links, and thanks for watching.